Globus. Thanks everyone for joining. We have a really exciting panel today. It's a very diverse panel that touches on many aspects of space uh, investment from the policy side, from the commercial side, from the startup side. Uh, and we have a real live astronaut. So, I mean, that's pretty cool that we have an astronaut as part of our panel. I think we're the only one in G1 that has an astronaut as part of the panel. So thank you, Naoko, for, for joining. <laughs> Thanks, please. <laughs> um, so I've been sitting in on the sessions today, and uh, many of the sessions have focused a lot on COVID, obviously. We're talking about moving uh, beyond COVID, what COVID has done to certain industries. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to really talk about COVID this whole session. So what I want to do is get this topic out of the way from the start, and then we'll talk about everything else. Because uh, I think space investments and what's happening now transcends COVID. So I don't want to make that be the topic. But because it is uh, a, a main part of this, let's um, just go around the panelists and get some um, input on uh, how COVID has impacted the work you're doing uh, and what you think the long-term impact of COVID is on the space sector, both the commercial uh, and government side. So why don't we just go down the line and then, um, well, actually, let me start with you, Naoko, and then we'll go around, because I'm gonna come back to you. So, Naoko, what's your uh, opinion from the work that you're doing, um, both with some of your groups and on the government side, the impact of COVID uh, and how you think uh, it's going to be long-term? Okay. Uh, from the point of view of having serving as a member of space policy committee under the cabinet office, actually together with Dr. Atsushi Tsunami, uh, I consider space is not a simple extension of the past anymore. Uh, actually, Japanese space basic plan was renewed this year for the first time in the five years, and it has a COVID effects affect as well uh, because the global situations are changing not only COVID but also US China friction and SpaceX uh, private sector screw dragons main spacecraft success and so on and actually the COVID-19 uh, affects lots of um, missions but still you know we launched as a H2A rocket at of the UAE Mars probe on time. And so most of the space missions are going on time, are not except H3 rocket development. And for the budget wise, actually, you know, you, due to the COVID-19, we are moving towards to the IoT society rapidly. So space data management is a good connection to those IoT society. And actually, we are discussing the next fiscal year's budget request right now. And you know, the Japanese space related budget combining those of all ministries has been between three to 3.5 billion US dollars in the past 10 years. But uh, for the next year's request, it is 5.2 billion US dollars. 1.6 billion more than this year, which is 1.5 times as much as this fiscal year. So I think, you know, the space is now more related to our daily lives. Thank you. So great to hear that the requested budget is such a big leap um, for, for Japan's space activities. Um, Atsushi. To you, you uh, also, as uh, Naoko said, are part of the policy committee um, for Japan space policy, but you also focus a lot on international. So if I can ask your input on the impact of COVID on uh, international regarding space. Yeah, um, you know, I work a lot on the uh, issues uh, dating the international cooperation for science and technology and also uh, what we call science diplomacy. But and of course, COVID really uh, raises attention, or actually uh, a need for 
a lot of international cooperation in, in you know, fighting for the pandemic and so on and so forth. But also on the other hand, of course, the heightened kind of geopolitical competition, not, on, not only just for the race for the uh, vaccine, but also uh, how are we gonna de deal with the data set that goes into the development of vaccine? What are the, uh, some of the uh, private, uh, privacy issues about the data management uh, in terms of some of the health conditions and all sorts of uh, uh, information that goes into the development of vaccine? And if you're gonna do this internationally, of course there's a lot of complications as to how you're gonna deal with this, how you're gonna share some of the work that you do. And there are a lot of competition, of course, going around of who's, who gets there first. So it's kind of a very interesting, in a way, of a complicated issue of both international competition and also international cooperation. But one thing for clear, it's clear, is that uh, we have to work together uh, either way. It just that doesn't make sense for each any of a, a corporate or co even a company just to do this on their own. So the, the, the argument for the space as well, I mean, there is a lot of elements that we're going to go back and talk about or more ge geopolitical issues of space utilization, but also when it comes to the exploration, nobody wants to do it at all. This is, the, this is an international effort. So there are a lot of uh, politics behind it, but I think it's a, it's a both ways, you know, competition and cooperation. Great. Um, Lewis, then, as we shift over to, uh, from the domestic and, and international uh, politics and the impact of COVID. What has it been uh, in, in your world, which is on the venture investment side? How has it impacted you? So we certainly see from the Airbus Ventures side uh, a direct impact across the 40 some companies that we've invested in across our funds. Um, a, a great many of those are directly space uh, portfolio companies um, and others are related to our broader thesis of all the deep technologies that are impacting the future of aerospace. I would say as startup companies, they have done uh, remarkably well. They have been uh, courageous in the face of organizing to work. If I take the example of a company like uh, Astrospace, in the US, um, you know, managing to continue to rocket launch uh, you know, and to do the 14 day quarantine between Kodiak, Alaska and uh, Alameda, California. 80% of their staff uh, managing through COVID as operation engineer to be able to succeed. This of course is in the context of uh, our Airbus mothership as well. So Airbus Ventures is a highly autonomous uh, venture fund that means we have, for example, multiple limited partner investors, including here in Japan uh, from Development Bank of Japan, the leasing arm of Mitsubishi, Fuyo Group, and so on. Um, but obviously our first limited partner, Airbus, uh, has been hugely hit by COVID. Um, you know, one of the, the first businesses to be most hit is in commercial aviation. So, you know, we hope that we do our part to accelerate innovation through the venture fund, through our startup companies, adding technologies that help to transition um, in, in our own way, uh, providing a degree of financial support, and if that saves a few more jobs in the process, then we're, then we're keen to do that. But I think it's also a rebalancing a bit. We're anticipating more emphasis on space, more emphasis on communications technologies. We see the importance of being able to work securely and remotely and with minimum time lag and in high quality and to move more digitally to design and manufacturing processes. So we see an acute interest both for and with our mothership Airbus and across our venture portfolio companies to be able to address these needs. That's great. And so I think we've seen from these three speakers looking at the macro picture of government, international, and investment that COVID, uh, rather than being a, a significant negative, has helped us to refocus on the importance of space uh, and how it's going to move it forward. But now let me ask the final question on the micro level, the actual <laughs> working level of a space startup. Uh, Takashi, how has it impacted you um, as the CEO of a space startup here? Well, uh, so I'm running a company uh, in Japan looking for the, uh, aiming for the lunar exploration in the future. In our company, we are developing hardware. So hardware requires concentrated human, uh, well, uh, work on the site. Uh, so it's gonna 
affect to our working style uh, in COVID-19. However, uh, in general, I think space industry itself str uh, strongly moved forward. So there is a market already, and then uh, we see the uh, very uh, strong demand from the, our customers. So that is very great. And then one thing we have to not forget is uh, responding to the, uh, well, COVID-19 is important on the Earth. However, at the same time, we don't need to uh, uh, close down the, the opportunity to go to the, to the space because the space industry definitely uh, support the, it's important asset to advance our life on the Earth as well. So uh, it's very important to not only in invest to the uh, time and the uh, uh, money to the uh, response to the uh, COVID-19 on the earth, but also to the, the activity to create future as well. Yeah, we really see that uh, as we're all shift to an online work environment, how important uh, information, data, communications from space is. It's literally been highlighted. Okay, we're about 10 minutes in, and that's the end of the COVID session. Um, we will now move on to talking about uh, space generally and how we can uh, accelerate this new economy. It's an exciting time, and uh, I'm working uh, as a COO of a startup here, and what we always talk about are there's three uh, legs three factors that are going to influence success. And it's the, the government side, which is the policy and the government investment. It's the business case side, finding those customers that are going to be able to fund space uh, companies through a commercial side. And then technology. How do we develop those technologies that are gonna make uh, space, uh, the space market thrive? Uh, now this is the case for so many new, new companies, new, new markets. Space, it's a little tougher when you're you know, lacking gravity and oxygen and all those basics that you need to make a business work. So it's a bit more difficult, but that's what I'd like to have the, the panel be focused on. And I'll start it off by asking uh, Naoko, uh, as we're trying to um, uh, bring on this new space economy, uh, which in the past has always been large companies and large governments, and now smaller governments are involved, and smaller companies are involved, like Takashi's and mine. Uh, what is the government's role in moving forward uh, this new space economy? Now, go. If I can start with you on that question. Sure. Uh, that's a very important point because you know I explained right now the Japanese budget for space-related uh, areas uh, is increasing for the next year. The main increases are in the following three areas, actually. The first one is Artemis program, which is a new international space explorations to the moon and beyond to expand the area of human activity initiated by the United States. And number two is space utilization, which is a data platform and an application to navigation, uh, disaster prevention, forestry, fisheries, agriculture, and so on. And number three is security. It's an including space operations squadron, newly formed this year under the Japan Air Self-Defense. And its main duty is to protect satellites because it is estimated that if navigation satellite systems were to be down, and it would cause an economic loss of 1 billion US dollars a day in the United States. So it has a huge impact. The satellite systems are now connected to our lives well and need to be protected. So uh, based on that, uh, the government um, priorities is to, uh, of course, national security and diplomacy, and also the long-term investment in uh, technology and the science, and also encouraging industry. Because uh, predictability of the government's budget is increasing, then the investment from private sectors will increase as well, and which will strengthen our economy as well. So I think space could be a catalyst 
for our industry and economy. So that's the government's priority to encourage those movement. So there's two, two threads I want to pull on uh, from now goes response. And one is how then the commercial industry and investment side interacts with the government. And one is how the international geopolitical angle. So I'm gonna go to the first one first. And Lewis, that would be um, for you as you're looking at investments in space and you think about the cooperative aspects with the priorities that Naoko mentioned, how do those line up with your decisions on where to invest, where to put venture capital, uh, and then do you see that, um, that they're, they're meshing or that there's any kind of divergence, or uh, how, how do you see it working together? I think that we would see um, a really natural meshing to start with. Um, you know, I think it's uh, true for venture capital in the hardware sector in particular that we see talent drawn from across the world into major initiatives. And these pools of talent m move and uh, with accelerated technologies now interact with each other across national boundaries. As, as Airbus Ventures, the part of Airbus we do keep even as an autonomous uh, venture arm is in our DNA, which is to be global, right? So Airbus is a company founded across the boundaries of Germany and France and Italy and what have you and puts up things in the sky that more or less stay up there. So um, we have this belief in the value of cross-cultural, multilingual, internationally collaborative as being the spine of, of great innovation and being able to do things really well. So when we see opportunities like uh, the Japanese government sponsorship and, and JAXA's work with um, other international space agencies to build this kind of platform, we're really, really encouraged. And we think it's consistent uh, with how we do it. As venture capitalists, uh, we are working in the commercial sector, right? So we're making the best investments we can for what we think will be the best financial return with the best teams, often international teams, and able to do that. And in the space sector in particular, I think we see these startup companies as a critical element, an absolutely critical element of innovation for space. And just to conclude on the kind of government to commercial side through venture, you know, we do see the, the national uh, space agencies increasingly looking to make similar investments in the same companies. And time to time, we do have uh, government agencies making co-investments in some of our startup companies. And normally, I would say that that is just par for the course. You know, it's, it's another aspect of having a business platform and commercial future opportunities. But I, if I were to signal one thing, I think it's that we want to keep the international and the collaborative in space industry. And if there's a divergence that might come, if it's too much emphasis on national investments, uh, then I think it kind of goes against the grain. Some of the most basic challenges in space, if I think about something like asteroid deflection to protect the planet, by its nature to us seems like a basically international collaborative kind of thing. But we actually see national interests in uh, developing technologies which could also see the weaponization of space. So we're trying to work with our stars, with our entrepreneurs, these great international creators to keep them international because there is a potential divergence. So Atsushi, how do we deal with that then? I mean, we, we've heard from Lewis and Naoko that this is a priority to be international. Uh, it's a priority to invest in, in space companies, but there's obvious geopolitical issues at play here. And so how do we reconcile this need to be international, solve a problem, uh, or, or uh, mm, we'll call it a problem, uh, create an economy that is going to be truly international, but with the geopolitical background that, that clearly is present in space. Uh, how do you think we can move forward with that? That's a tough one. That's a tough question, Chris. But um, I, it's, it's a space, of course, if you think about what uh, uh, Hakamada has mentioned about how you explore the, some of the technologies and solutions in the uh, space realm and bring those technology and solutions back to the Earth and solve our problems here on the Earth as well. We call it dual utilization of this space. Uh, 
R&D or innovation, but I think that would also bring up the issue of geopolitical ones. I mean, space, of course, if you look at the uh, deep space, I mean, the, it's hard to really imagine the kind of a geopolitical uh, rivalry going on over there. Uh, it's, uh, but if you see it uh, right here on the Earth, of course, that's what the, uh, we are all concerned with. And especially when we talk about the space, uh, China is the big player. And uh, we are all sort of striving the way to see the way we can work with China or not. And uh, that it's the, of course, space is not the only issue for China. But, I mean, we, we have to find also other areas of emerging technologies and, and that we are thinking of how we're going to cooperate or we're going to work or we cannot work with China on this. So this, this thing is a, is a very ongoing sort of challenge for um, not just for space. Um, but I think um, Lewis is right. I mean, nobody wants to do this alone. I mean, it costs a lot. And it doesn't really make sense in the business side to just, you know, or duplication of the program. Uh, each national age, you know, uh, space agencies have its own very similar kind of programs. I mean, can we do this something like the Airbus does, right? I mean, the sort of corporate uh, or co-funding uh, with the different, uh, you know. So kind of uh, we can start with finding good partners uh, across internationally and then build upon it. And, and maybe the sort of the kind of norm of investing, doing business, even the space, uh, then we can expand it and say, look, uh, you know, we, how are we going to do with uh, China? We can do other countries that are coming in the space programs, uh, space, uh, and how can we can sort of develop the how to work with them. But uh, at the beginning, we need to find a way to work with, say, United States or Europe on all these things and, and then see what we can do, right? So this is something that uh, it's an ongoing process, but it's a hard one. Hard one. It's got to be incremental, but um, we've got to get there because uh, this is an issue that we, as a global community, need to solve. It's not uh, relegated to one country or one alliance. So it is something we have to think about. Um, staying then with this theme on uh, the government involvement and investment, Takashi. Um, what is uh, what are you doing with iSpace in terms of uh, as you go forward? Where do you see the priority? in terms of a, a, a future customer base? Do you see that as being the government? Uh, how much influence does the government investment uh, and interaction have with you? Well, so the, the space is currently dominant. My, my main customer is government. Uh, that is clear. Uh, so the, uh, our company also are looking forward uh, working with government, not for government, but with government. I think uh, then uh, well we are uh, well uh, provided uh, cost efficient uh, frequent flight to the lunar surface to promote their science activities and also in the future utilization of the resources on the lunar surface, and then uh, with such a government customer is uh, well uh, uh, very important as initial phase. However, as as well uh, we have been discussing the. We need international collaboration, not only just the government level, but also industry level as well. So the, uh, in the next era, I believe that uh, the infrastructure on the lunar surface will be developed both from the government and also commercial uh, private company as well. So the private company also need to start uh, working on technology, technology development and then uh, how to uh, develop the uh, facility or the uh, system on the on, on the lunar surface or the in space, and then so we are looking for the uh, such a, uh, private customers also uh, start investing uh, first small amount of money. However, we see the uh, big uh, market in the in the future. So as we focus there on the government side, um, I want to stay on it for just one more. Uh, question here back to you, Atsushi, on the, the regulatory side of the, of the question. Um, so from, a, from we talk about the investment side and the cooperation side, what about the regulation? We, we say that uh, the orbit is, a, we, we call it a commons, orbital commons, and so no one country owns it. So uh, where do you see the, the, the regulation proceeding then to help to uh, incentivize more development? 
I think the, uh, the uh, case of uh, rule-based uh, kind of um, uh, making, business, uh, making process in the space area is also is very important, of course. You have to have technology and you have to be there so that you can actually make a claim about what sort of rules and what sort of the regulations are necessary. Of course, uh, your company is, of course, leading that in terms of the space debris and, and how we're going to think about uh, uh, sort of can we sort of, sort of find a way that we, when we talked about the, say, uh, environmental issues, uh, there is a global kind of a dialogue of how to manage that. Can we sort of extend it to that notion to the uh, outer space and say, we are you know, putting all these satellites without thinking of how we're going to, uh, you know, uh, about the degrees and where they're going to go. And so in other words, can we come up with the rules, right? And that rules has to back with the you know, technology and the business model so that it makes sense to have the sort of a viable rules and so on and so forth. So I think it's coming. And I think it's necessary for another business investment in those areas as we go see it. And, and again, this goes back to the geopolitical issue as well, right? So when can, can we agree on the kind of set of the business rules or regulations? And, and can we all agree to that? And of course, there are many big players out there that may say just no way, right? We do our own self, ourselves. So that's, a, that's the tough, but that's, that requires the government getting in there and making sure that we have the agreement and we have to have a partners to do that, right? So that's a, a good question, but it's a very <laughs> a tough one as well. They're all tough in this, in this industry. They're all tough in space. They're all the questions are. And uh, Lewis, back to something you, had, you mentioned in, in passing as you were talking about uh, the importance of international cooperation. This, this little thing of financial return, just a minor, minor topic, right? Uh, financial return and how important that is. So we, we hear what Atsushi is talking about with this huge hill to climb in the regulatory environment and geopolitical environment. It, it might take some time to get to some kind of consensus on these issues, but investors are looking for financial return under a specific timeline. Um, what do you then see as, uh, as is it going to be necessary to have this kind of uh, regulatory regimes in place to reach toward a financial return for a lot of your investments? Or can they be commercially viable on their own in a, in a strictly commercial environment? And as an, in, as an investor, what, what then do you see as the, as the return uh, timeline profile for this? You keep up the easy questions, Chris. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> so I, I think that um, directionally, uh, regulation is very important. Um, to a venture capitalist as well. Um, you know, we want to see an international framework that provides a degree of stability for further longer term investments. As venture capitalists, we manage a portfolio. And in that portfolio, we expect some of our companies to, uh, to achieve, you know, billion dollar valuations, to be able to return, um, you know, maybe 10x or more value. Great if that happens. Um, we have others that are longer term bets within our portfolio. So, for example, you know, we invested in a an automotive dealership connecting system, an ERP system, um, which connects automotive consumers, manufacturers, OEMs, and dealerships, because we saw broad applicability to other manufacturing sectors, including specifically space. It happens that the CEO is the former CIO of SpaceX, right? So, you know, they have put together a fantastically well-talented uh, team. They have major contracts with automotive OEMs, and one day they're going to have a huge pack impact on the space industry. We're very confident of it. Will they hit a regulatory barrier before we can return money to our investors? Probably not, right? Others. Um, at, the, at the frontier ends of our investments may not even be space specific. So we've invested in a company called Catalog DNA. Not only is it storing huge amounts of data into DNA molecules, it's also training the enzymes to do computation in the molecule. So this is a kind of massive complement to quantum computing. Sometimes you want big computing, sometimes you want complex computing. We're probably gonna need something like that 
And, and this is a longer term play and, and we will head there. For things related specifically to the orbital environment and later to deep space, surely in the business that you're in, uh, Chris, um, when we look at issues of debris and orbital risk and deorbiting and everything related to precious resources of orbit, you know, from spectrum to other things, I personally would see um, uh, a need for uh, stronger regulation sooner to be able to encourage the kind of returns and the timelines that we would like to be able to see. The, uh, I personally think that there's an analog. Uh, having done uh, quite a bit of work on the ocean and ocean mining side in my past, the UN did actually organize, after many painful years, an international seabed authority. If you want to mine the oceans and find resources today in the high seas, you can actually get an exploration license from the International Seabed Authority, and you have a permission of time, and the profits go to actually developing research um, into those areas. So time to time, I've raised the question of why not an International Space Authority, a, a, a regime which allows for better insurance schemes, more international collaboration, a set of principles. It's not an International Space Agency, it's an International Space Authority to help with commons resources. And one of the reasons I'm so thrilled to be based here in Tokyo is that actually Japan has a tremendous commitment to international space law and policy. There's probably a higher concentration of space lawyers here than I've seen anywhere else. And I think Japan could actually have quite a unique role in moving towards something like an international space authority to provide that kind of regime. In terms of our payback, look, we, uh, we manage a 10-year fund, right? Um, We've managed a couple, we're now uh, raising. And um, the, uh, the opportunities we look for typically are in the three to five year time frame, so it's pretty aggressive. You know, we like to see an exit. It might be an IPO or an acquisition by others. Um, but because these are building bricks of space technology, we find many practical opportunities for them. And we have some room, some room at the edges of our fund to look at those longer return kind of arcs. So we're hoping that this acceleration toward greater needs for space is also going to accelerate the pace of innovation. We were one of the first um, deep tech hardware aerospace space oriented venture funds. In the Valley five years ago when we raised this with our pure VC friends, they said, you must be kidding. You know, mm -hmm. aerospace is this kind of decadal long, you know, things don't move fast enough. Now every major VC in the Valley you know, from Kleiner Perkins to Bessemer to Sequoia, Lightspeed, all our co-investors, they all have people assigned to space. They all have space companies in their portfolio. They're pushing, pushing, pushing. This is potentially the nice next hyper growth sector for all of us in venture capital. And it would help a lot to have a better regulatory framework to backstop this, to, to be able to capture and accelerate this momentum. That's great, so much to break down. I'm gonna to have to watch the video later to just understand all of the different stuff that, that we're talking about. Um, but a couple things to, to touch on. First, three to five year return, is that what the others in the Valley are looking at too, in, even in the aerospace sector? Absolutely, so we're, we're playing the same game with them. Uh, we, when we give a term sheet, we're looking for these regular VCs to come and play with us. We jump, jump in on their term sheets when they offer capital to uh, the startup companies. So the good news is that the space sector has now moved into uh, the reality of venture capital. And, um, and I think that for companies like, like everyone here, um, it denotes a real opportunity and one that's growing faster. So Takashi, three to five year return. What do you think? <laughs> um, so well. <laughs> Tough question. Yeah, so not, not tough. <laughs> I guess yeah. that's kind of a question. So the, yeah, uh, well, most of people think that in space industry, aerospace industry, the, the investment is very wrong, and then the uh, profit is far ahead, uh, 10 years, 20 years. However, recently, the, uh, well, acceleration of the space industry at the market, and then shift to the government, to the private sectors. So we foresee more uh, in short time of the period for the generating uh, profit and then revenue. And then from the entrepreneur side as well, we should uh, make more effort to generate revenue, uh, not only from the space industry, but also the other 
uh, industry as a portfolio. Otherwise, there's no sustainability. So uh, that is, I think, the important from the uh, well, entrepreneur side to have more, uh, well, increase the, have more incentive to increase the market uh, portfolio and then uh, attractive for the investors to get invested. And, and if I can just clarify, um, so return in the world of venture capital means return to investors. And, and maybe our friends uh, at SpaceX and Elon Musk can attest that it is possible to maybe not yet technically be earning a profit, but um, still have an enormous valuation and be returning to investors. So some of his first investors have cashed out, right? So they're, they're making money. Um, if one of our portfolio companies is acquired by somebody else before they've even made a profit, typically they're looking for the revenue. So the key for anyone who is considering a startup company in the space sector, like yourselves, is earning revenue. And if there's evidence of significant revenue inside that three to five year time frame, then there is every chance for uh, an IPO, there's every chance for an acquisition, there's every chance for a licensing agreement, there's every chance for some kind of refinancing. So even before the long-term profitability, venture capital is unique in its ability to kind of spike the companies to being able to cross these thresholds. So we see ourselves as important partners for startup companies with a, it's a, it's one of the highest levels of risk that, a, that a, an entrepreneur can embrace, but it also offers this high impact ability to kind of punch through, which may be exactly what we need when the typical horizons have been 10 years or more. We can provide and accelerate the finance to provide return to investors in that time. Frame. That's good, thank you for that clarification. That's important to point out, especially for us, I think. Okay. Um, so, uh, Naoko, we're, we're talking about different uh, aspects of the, uh, the new space sector, uh, and one of them that we haven't touched on as much down here, uh, or here on the stage, is, um, is human space flight, uh, space tourism. And being the only person on the panel and in the room who's actually experienced what it's like to uh, be in orbit, um, I, I want to ask you what you think are the prospects for uh, space tourism as uh, a future business. Um, and so, you know, generally from your experience uh, as an astronaut, and I know you talk about this a lot, uh, how you would, would highlight this as a viable market going forward, and do you think that this is something that we're going to see uh, in the near term? Well, thanks, Chris. Well, uh, you know, as Louise mentioned, you know, five, it's different situation right now be comparing to five years ago. Five years ago, space tourism was still a dream, but now it's getting reality because SpaceX uh, succeeded in the launch of human beings to space and Virgin Galactics is very close to its commercial manned space flight, space tourism flight. And uh, I co-founded Space Port Japan Association two years ago uh, to make a space tourism happen in Japan as well. And the main purpose is to settle the legislation in Japan for the manned space flight and also combining and making ecosystem of the industry. So I think it's very close to realistic. So uh, as I mentioned, you, you know, uh, there are aspects of autonomous and cooperation and so far uh, in japan has uh you know the independence of space transportation was a policy so japan developed its own rockets and a rocket was a liquid and a solid rockets so uh but besides that utilization it should be more incorporated internationally including manned space flight and space tourism because there are still not a certain uh strong market yet it's arising so in that phase to create a market we need to cooperate more uh between public government and the private and between nations so it's in the face. So it's very exciting to create a market. Yeah, very much. So um, when this uh, 
human space flight, space tourism comes into play, how many on the stage are going to be buying tickets? That's, yes, Lewis for sure. Atsushi, you in? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, Takashi? I'm going to the moon. <laughs> oh, that's here. And, and you as well, I assume now. You'd, you'd be ready to go again? Sure, anytime. <laughs> so then thinking about this uh, human space tourism as a potential market, what do the, the panelists, and I'll, I'll kind of open it up, but uh, I think, Takeshi, I know what your answer is going to be, so it's a bit for the others. Where do you see the, um, the best near-term uh, business potential in terms of sectors uh, in space uh, in the future? So obviously, I think I know what your answer is going to be, Takeshi. I'm guessing it's going to be lunar exploration. Uh, I think my answer is going to be pretty obvious in terms of space debris removal. But let me ask uh, Lewis and Atsushi and Naoko, where do you see uh, the highest potential for a business in the new space market? So if anybody who wants to start. So um, uh, all of these are key opportunities that have been mentioned so far. Um, at the moment, I think uh, we are encouraging those companies that can really perform stronger uh, communication delivery. It has uh, some of the highest impacts, we think, in the near term. So the ability to, um, to compress data, to move it efficiently, to provide it to many users, to be able to do more onboard processing of uh, satellite and spacecraft, moving these satellites to higher levels of intelligence um, so that they can make more good decisions on orbit and in deep space. Um, so we're looking very closely at technologies that um, support you know, 5G, uh, free space optics, laser communications, things that reduce the time lag between, for example, a human operator of a telexistence robot and, uh, and its avatar on the other side of the planet or from you know, gateway to the surface of the moon. You know, how does an, how does an astronaut move? Uh, vehicles, robots, other elements in between. So um, I'm really encouraging uh, companies that are advancing, for example, machine learning and artificial intelligence for new means of, as mentioned, computer data storage and uh, manipulation, and being able to deliver that value back to Earth. So picking one further example, you know, Atlas AI in, in the US, we have a company that is taking satellite and drone imagery of the Earth and uh, using machine learning to take the data archive and do predictive economics for developing countries specifically. So in Africa, doing accurate predictions of crop yields, of electrification, of road infrastructure development, for telecommunications, for tower deployment, all based on intelligent interpretation requiring massive computing power requiring a very big data archive and requiring a machine learning predictive algorithm to be able to build off of it. But this is today's business. You know, this is a company in business today, um, which will pave the way for so many of these other. Great, thanks. Uh, Atsushi? Yeah. Just to add on Lewis's point, I think the, uh, of course, what we call it the Society 5.0 in terrestrial and with today, and we see it, uh, the extension of that with the dual utilization with the space. So the communication, of course, is definitely the, the, the point. And, and adding to that is energy for me. I think uh, we have a lot of potential uh, utilizing the space for developing some of the further uh, energy uh, resource. And, and because we need to have the energy utilized and produced outside of the, uh, in the space in order to operate in the space anyway. How can we solve that uh, with some of the, uh, and so, and so we, you know, even including the uh, next generation of nuclear technology as well. Naoko, any comment on that for where the next big markets will be in space? Yeah, in addition to space tourism, I think, you know, those kind of space planes can be utilized to connect point to point between countries. So flying closer to space, uh, it can, you know, fly faster and it could connect for example, Tokyo to New York, less than one hour. So those kind of, you know, hypersonic point-to-point -point technology could be a 
potential huge market. And in Japan, uh, so far, Oita Airport announced its plan to make it a spaceport as well, and Okinawa Shimoji Airport as well. So I think it's you know uh, a good transportation hub, not only space for the on the ground as well, and also uh, it's a uh, good um, hub for the aerospace industry. So I expect those potentials. Great, thank you. It's just a, that was a great comprehensive view of the of the variety of different um, markets that are out there. <clears throat> In addition to lunar mining and space debris removal, of course, of course. Needless to say, um, okay, we've come to uh, Q and A time. We're about fifteen minutes left. So, um, as uh, you might have seen in other panels, what we'll do is take uh, three questions and then uh, let uh, the panelists uh, uh, answer those. So, let's do three questions right now from the audience or from the web. Okay, anybody from the audience? We'll take three questions first. Uh, no, we have one question on the web. One, sorry. One, one question. One. Okay. So, anybody in the audience first? Uh, yeah, right here. I have a dummy question. Um, is it possible to use space technology to to help uh, prevent climate change? Okay. Any other questions in the audience? Uh, I'd like to know how far today's technology for humankind to live habitat on the space. To live in space. Yes. Anybody else in the audience? Yeah, in the back there. So you said in terms of legislation, uh, one of the reasons was some large companies would kind of uh, refuse or not agree with it. Uh, what are the reasons as to why they couldn't agree with it? And uh, how could you, I don't know, tweak the legislation to get them on board with the, what you guys are proposing? Well, let me make sure I understood that. You're saying uh, legislation, the reasons that it's, that it's difficult, and then how to get people on board? Yeah. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so we have three questions, and the first is on um, uh, uh, climate change, using space technology to address the issue of Anybody want to yeah. take that? Sorry, the first question was uh, climate change. Uh, how we can use space technology to uh, assess uh, or help out with the issue of climate change. Um, there's a lot of satellites up there that are observing uh, the environment right now. A anybody want to take that one? Naoko? Well, thanks for the question. That's a very good point. Uh, Japan developed several satellites to monitor the green gas effect uh, or the entire globe. And the previous two satellites could monitor the global uh, range of the carbon dioxide or methane and so on. But the next ones could be, could be able to monitor more precisely for each factory area, for each country, so that we can assess, you know, which point which you know uh, sources generate more green gas effect gas and so on so that could help so we could be a uh, good eyes and ears to the to prevent the uh, climate change and then we need some actions that's uh, another point so at least we could you know, monitor uh, the global change it's very important so I think in, in that case, you know, space could be a good contributor. Yeah, Atsushi, yeah. additional? Uh, yes, and also uh, I work on the Arctic uh, issues as well. And uh, all the basis of the Arctic or the evidence that provides by the satellites and Japanese NASA, I mean, uh, JAXA actually has a Suzuku satellite which just measures the, how much of the melting of the ice happening on the Arctic area. And that will give the uh, basis for any policy or uh, uh, regulatory uh, discussions. So that is a very important role that the satellite plays. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue for all space agencies in Europe, uh, US, Japan, globally to focus on measuring climate change, very important. Uh, the next question was on technology to live in space. I would say that we already have it, and again, we have somebody who has done it on the panel. So we have people who, who are living in space, 
I guess the question is more uh, of long term and maybe even to the, to the moon. So living not just in low Earth orbit, but living on the moon where we are on technology now and what we're going to need to develop. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, well, I mean, Naoko can answer this directly, but Lewis or Takashi, any feedback on that one? Me first. Uh, well, we are envisioning uh, using the moon as a one of the, uh, as a part of the ecosystem to su to sustain the life on the Earth. However, uh, and on the sites and on the same time, uh, we envision uh, more than uh, one thousand people living on the moon uh, around twenty forty. Uh, such a people will. Uh, contribute to uh, develop the resources and then uh, create uh, well uh, devices or the uh, well industry to support the uh, life on the earth. So the technological reserves uh, many uh, still uh, advancement is required. However, uh, such a time frame would be, I think, the very uh, feasible. And if I may, and maybe this is again more of a personal observation, but the um, that kind of a community, you know, a thousand people by 2040 on the moon, it's usually exciting. I would anticipate probably echo something like uh, the current inhabitants of Antarctica, where it's largely science-led and science-driven, with a strong international treaty underpinning. Uh, cooperation by individual nation states and a few companies and scientific research institutions, you know, working in a f pretty collaborative manner to try to get things done. And as much as we as venture capitalists appreciate the, the, the energy of some of the biggest entrepreneurs to, to colonize space and asteroids and Mars and so on, you know, the rush to do that without having created some kind of a collaborative infrastructure, you know, could be um, could be difficult. So, although for many of us, I, I love that there's the opportunity to go for fun, you know, into into orbit or whatever. But I but I think for also I hope the most of us and and for our friends and children, you know, to encourage that it's kind of a working life. You know, if if exploration and science turns you on, if creating the engineering and infrastructure to be able to do scientific discovery in a, in a new place like the moon appeals, then these are the kinds of things that we want to really encourage. And they kind of go hand in hand. You know, the, the international collaboration system to provide an Antarctica phase one, you know, for the moon could be a really positive way to, to approach it. Working tourists, I guess, yeah. That's a, that's a great way to put it, and it actually leads well into the third question, I think. You said what we need is uh, international science-based underpinned by an international treaty. You basically described the International Space Station, is what you just described in that. And I know you were talking about uh, lunar development, but that's what we've done over the past 25 years or so in building up a current human presence in space, and that's what we're going to need to do going forward. So the third question then, uh, reasons to, uh, or how to convince legislators to work together to develop some um, positive legislation towards space development, and I assume domestic and international norms. Uh, how do we push that forward? And I'll open this to um, Atsushi and, and Naoko. Actually, um, the, the th I just wanted to highlight what the Luis was saying about the sort of drawing parallel with the ocean. And I work also in the ocean area and uh, international seabed authority and, and some of the regulations and some of the collaborative work on high seas of utilizing some of the resources in the ocean. This ocean actually is also the frontier that we, don't, we haven't really explored yet. And it's very much similar to the space that we are talking about. And so the legislations and the national interest and cooperation among the nations would come if, uh, as we are start to think about utilizing it. And uh, as Hakamada san and, 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 and saying how the space is already here with us. So now it's time to really to think about uh, putting some of the laws and regulations and so on and so forth to encourage further investment and, and the stability of the kind of business environment 
that uh, we can all create. And uh, I think this is, this is something, it's the next phase of uh, the things that are coming. So I think I, I have no problem, I don't see any problem really uh, that the legislators are not working together. I think they are very passionate, I think, when it comes to this. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very uh, interesting, but I mean, exciting moment, the moment. Any comment on that, Naoko, about the legislators uh, working together there? Yeah, uh, I agree with that, Sushi. And I think, you know, it's a very positive side for the legislation can work together because it's related to the first question of the global warming. I think, you know, if we, it's space is not for fun, not for exploration, but for the Earth. If we put, we can put some, you know, factories or power plants in space, we can protect the Earth, right? As Jeff Bezos says the same thing. I think, you know, the Earth itself could be the world heritage in a whole globe. So uh, space uh, could be a good, you know, um, investment for the future. So that's why we need to work together. I like that concept. So not a world heritage site, but a universal heritage site. The Earth exactly. as a universal heritage site. Yes, the first cool. groundbreaking universal heritage site. Uh, we have about four minutes left. Um, another round of questions, uh, if we have them. First from the audience here. There's one question online. OK, we'll take that then. Want to do the one okay. online first? All right, the question is by uh, Mr. Joshua Archer. How much would it cost to have a vacation in space? OK, uh, the cost of transportation to space. Uh, in the audience, any other questions? Okay. Hello, thank you. I'm Mahmoud Nazari. I'm a correspondent of uh, Arab News Japan, which is one of the sponsors. Thank you for making this event a great success. And also, I am correspondent for uh, UAE News Agency. And we know UAE News, uh, UAE uh, government sent a hope probe to Mars a few uh, months ago, and uh, it's expected to make a good uh, result there. And I would like your uh, assessment of this uh, breakthrough in, in, in space uh, participation of some countries that have no uh, history in such uh, endeavors and how uh, could the international cooperation help uh, developing countries, especially in, in, in a certain part of the world that has some uh, instability to advance in space and make a chance for uh, more cooperation and peace. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think we'll cut it at two questions. We only have about two and a half minutes. So um, first question, the cost of transport to space, it varies widely, of course. Uh, so maybe, uh, Louis or Takashi, um, uh, how much does it cost to transport? Maybe we can ask, you know, I know we maybe can't say specifics, but how much it costs to send something to the moon, Takashi? Uh, and then Louis, just generally, if you have any comments. Well, currently, the, if you want to send something to the lunar surface, the, the price tag is several million dollars per kilogram. That is the, the price tag. But this is far lower than the government missions, I believe. If, if you'd like to get something into Earth orbit, I think you can begin anticipating uh, something less than um, half a million dollars per launch, up to 300 kilos. Drastic, drastic drop in price to uh, Earth orbital launch, low Earth orbit. So think SpaceX and then keep going. Add, add another 10x drop, keep going. That's a drastic reduction. <laughs> so that's, that's not now, let's, let's make it clear. That's not now. Inside of three to five years. <laughs> that's great, I like it. Um, and then of course launching a human might be a little more expensive with everything else that a human comes with. <laughs> so, um, the other question was on, uh, on UAE and smaller countries, developing countries, non-traditional space agencies. Uh, how, how does the panel view that? And I'll ask this one to Atsushi and, and Naoko. Thank you for that question. I think that's a very, uh, for, for us anyway, the uh, success of launch of UAE um, is, is really the sort of the first step of uh, this international cooperation. And the importance of the international cooperation from the business side, I think that it really ensures the market, right? I mean, it, it, just working with one government doesn't produce much of the viable market. 
But once you start to work with the other countries, especially that are very uh, 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 thinking of using space for, uh, uh, say, uh, agriculture crops or even the sustainable fisheries and so on and so forth, uh, African states, um, South, Southeast Asian states, Indonesia, Vietnam, and all these countries are very important to work with, and that's what uh, we need to do internationally. So, so we've we've basically hit our time, and I was instructed very clearly to end on time. So I think we'll end there. Now, Kosari, to not give you uh, the last last question, but this clearly shows we need a longer panel on space and more panels on space. So uh, this was a fantastic discussion. I want to thank uh, everybody for joining, and uh, applause, please, for the panelists uh, who are here. Globus.